Nigeria, Africa's most populous country, the continent's second largest economy, the largest oil exporter with an abundance of natural resources, and the continent's largest natural gas reserve, celebrates another year of independence. Today, the 1st of October 2021. A country unlike any other in its diversity of tribes, cultures, religions, and expressions will mark its 61st year of independence. After decades of British colonial rule, the British Union Jack was lowered just before midnight on the 1st of October 1960. The lights were turned on and the green-white green flag was hoisted officially for the first time for all to see. A move followed by a shower of fireworks and then the military band joyfully played. Providing those present at the race course, now the foul Balewa Square, Obalim de Lagos, with an unforgettable experience. Several hours later, on the 1st of October 1960, a representative of Queen Elizabeth II handed over Nigeria's constitution to Abubakar Tafawa Balewa, the country's new prime minister who assumed power and led independent Nigeria's new coalition government. A feat worthy of a week-long celebration in most parts of the country, particularly amongst the three major tribes at the time, the Yorubas in the west, Hausas in the north, and the Igbos in the east, signaling the beginning of a country divided along the very lines that unite them all. At the very least, the birth of a new constitution increased confidence and capacity to finally embark on the journey of nationhood. Uh, the atmosphere then was very, very beautiful and colorful. It was a, a feeling of euphoria, feeling of freedom. Everybody was happy that uh, we gained uh, independence. Uh, though I was, I was uh, just living primary school there, all schools around, they all did march pass, you know, and uh, they, I mean, they were giving souvenir, you know, uh, flag, you know, Nigerian flag, you know, the small, small ones, the uh, souvenir and so on. It was colorful, it was beautiful, you know. Everybody was happy that we gained independence, you know, at that time. We were very happy, very happy. The honeymoon, however, did not last long. Six years after independence, Balewa was assassinated by over-ambitious young military officers on the 15th of January, 1996. Thus, began Nigeria's descent into an unavoidable three-year civil war that claimed the lives of over a million people. And between 1970 and 1999, the country made quick transition from one military rule to the other as military coups began the order of the day. And as fate would have it, the military government led by General Abdus Salam Abu Bakr decided to pass on the administrative touch to the civilians on the 29th of May, 1999. Although the 1990s were a tumultuous decade in Nigeria political history, with events such as the military annulment of the June 12, 1993 general election, imposition of an interim government of the country, 
global condemnation of the 1995 hanging of nine environmental activists, including Ken Saruwiwa, by military ruler General Sonny Abacha, and Abacha's death in 1998. The transition to democratic rule was seen by many as an opportunity to redeem what has been destroyed in the past, and there was hope that this new civilian administration, led by Olusegun Obasanjo, would usher in a new era for the country. Yeah, ordinarily, uh, transition to civil rule is a release, or could be seen as a relief. Relief in the sense that the worst democratic government or regime is even better than the best military regime that Nigeria, you know, passed through a spell of military rule is, you know, you know, I call it a spell. Mm -hmm. So, but that in 1999, they were, Nigeria was able to transit from military rule to democratic rule to be seen as a relief. A relief in the sense that government will be run by the majority of the people. There will be democratically elected president. Then there will be a kind of an open door policy where career will be open to talent. So that is it. Then the interplay of democracy and political participation without political party will be brought to bear in a democratic setting. You know definitely that America since 1776 or 1778 or probably 1790 when there was uh, an election after the Philadelphia Congress has been practicing democracy all through. So, in a democratic setting, your voice will be heard. The voice of the people will be heard. Vox Populi, Vox Dei, it will be interplay. Then there will be a kind of juxtaposition of ideas. There will be a kind of, uh, you know, lawmakers that will interpret, that will make law, that will appropriate bill that will carry out oversight functions. So all those things will be done. Many people will enjoy it. Government will be brought closer to the people than military regime who rule, whose rule is always a dictator, who rule by the boot of the gun. So if you look at it from that perspective, it is a relief. However, 61 years after independence and 22 years of uninterrupted democratic rule in the country, Unity has remained the rallying point for successive administrations to keep the diverse tribes and religions as one. Religionism takes root in the political systems as the country struggle to be one. And while the country still faces deeper problems, six administrations have been troubled in the country leading many to believe that nationalist politicians struck a deal with the colonial masters to retain the structures of colonialism under an independent Nigeria. And while others believe that Nigeria independence was flawed by an inability to take charge of its own future. It was that government, it was that pattern, that colonial pattern as it has been in Britain that was, you know, followed. But that does not necessarily mean that it will not be changed. For instance, in 1979, we had a democratically elected presidential system. Uh, so uh, that, 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 that explains the reason. They may follow it to some extent and before you know what is happening, they will do it to their own way. But of course, more ideas and theories will be welcomed as the country's problems persist. Security concerns remain high, particularly since the emergence of the radical Islamist sector, Boko Haram, in the northeast, where armed groups have killed over 36,000 people in the last decades, forcing an estimated 2.4 million people to flee their homes. While in central and northwest Nigeria, clashes between ethnically mixed but predominantly Christian farmers and Muslim Fulani herders 
as well as vigilantes and criminal gangs are common. Politically, Nigeria is divided, resulting in major issues being vigorously and violently contested along intricate ethnic, religious, and regional lines. The most contentious issues are those concerning state power, resource allocations, and citizenship. And obviously, states with such divisions are prone to uncertainty as they share little in terms of convergence and harmony, which are required to reduce forces that can trip them apart. We have to be in a way that the federal government will be, the component unit will also be, then states that is producing will have to benefit. There has to be comparative advantage of a nation producing this good to another nation producing this good. If it is a haphazard arrangement, if it is a lopsided arrangement, there will be agitation. So. The kind of agitation that we are witnessing now is as a result of the fact that a component unit is not benefiting from the resources that it's producing. And ordinarily nobody will be happy. No, no, uh, no hen will be happy that all its eggs are being taken without adequate food being given to that hen. The current agitation all over the places it's as a result of the failure of our uh, governance. The governance is no longer as uh, expected. We are no longer the same independent nation that we used to be. And uh, today, we know that so many things have failed. Government has failed the nation in various sectors, in education, the power sector, economically, all this lead to agitation of people to secede, to have their own nation where they believe that they can manage themselves better. Uh, for instance, the current issue of this um, uh, VAT is a great pointer where state generates money for the federal government to spend. We know what is happening today now that um, the about 50.5 percentage of what government, of federal government gets from VAT is from Lagos State. And by the time money is being shared, Lagos they will not have as much as half of what uh, the state generates. And this goes for every other state, uh, particularly in the South. So all this will come together to give people the thinking that we are suffering. The thing that we no longer belong. The thinking that the country has failed and the thinking that it is high time we go on our ways. I would say that one, going forward, for uh, as it is now, we need to review the need for a constitutional review. The constitutional review, the domain, especially from the point of view of the various applications across the country, no part of the country is waging a war against uh, other parts of the country. We are not saying, Nigerians are not saying, their houses are not, their Fulanis are not, their Egos are not, their Yogas are not, or that the Niger Delta are not. What Nigerians are saying is that there should be a constitutional review. While Nigeria has made some socio-economic progress in recent years, its human capital development has lacked due to underinvestment. And the country is still facing massive developmental challenges, such as the need to reduce reliance on oil and diversify the economy. It should be remembered that during colonial rule, Nigeria remained an agricultural country, exporting raw materials to Britain and importing finished goods from it. 
Therein lay the origins of Nigeria's economy's reliance on commodity markets in the industrialized Western world for foreign exchange, which led to the direction and planning of economic growth and development with the establishment of the educational sector to provide the necessary skills and labor force for development. Infrastructure of roads and communication networks. Hydroelectrical dams were built to generate electricity. Secondary industries and automobile assembly plants were established to create more employment opportunities. But due to over-reliance on government and foreign private bodies, industrial capacity utilization could only be reduced. And as a result, a country that was once known as the largest producers and exporters of palm oil, rice, poultry, corn, cocoa, peanuts, and rubber has lost its status due to a variety of factors such as labor migration from rural to urban areas, the low status given to agriculture in youth education, inefficient marketing, inadequate transportation infrastructure, lack of refrigeration, and trade restrictions. On the investment as a result of lack of credit, low prices, and unstable pricing policies resulting in farmers literally subsidizing urban dwellers and other sectors of the economy. A situation that has exacerbated the problems of inflation and unemployment to this day. We have predominantly been dependent on oil in Nigeria. And if you look back, way back into the early 60s, the North was very good in the, in the growth, in the development, in the production of granite. And that was why we had granite granites in the North. In the East, we had Afghanistan. In the South, when we had coffee, we had cocoa. And that was where the development, in the industrial development in Nigeria was so bad. Graduates were getting jobs. Even undergraduates were having a person jobs. There was Dunlop producing. There, there was a rubber plantations producing rubber. There were glass industries. There were cocoa industries. We were importing cocoa, we were importing coffee, we were importing this. It's all this before the oil boom. still, infrastructural facilities, including those in the energy sector, remain in despair. The government's economic revival program was predicated on a massive inflow of foreign investment, which did not materialize. A situation that has been blamed on the high cost of doing business in Nigeria, as well as a lack of transparency in the country's economic decision making. And in addition to these realities, the country's unemployment rate has remained unchanged for years after the restoration of civilian government, forcing each administration into external debts. You cannot compare the infrastructures we had then with the, uh, the infrastructures we have now. The, then, the country was manageable. The, the, the towns were manageable. But, but now, Nigeria has expanded, Nigeria has, I mean, the towns expanded, you know, and uh, then the people governing us, they were not 
corrupt, they were not too self-centered, you know. They, they work for themselves, not for the, for the masses any longer. So that's why it's not easy to compare now with the past. And to correct uh, the situation now is very, very difficult to correct it. Because people are egocentric, they, 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 they prefer to be on their own. Look at what is happening in Nigeria today. Uh, if uh, they want to, whoever is there, we want to please his people. And, you know, in, in terms of uh, giving appointments, all this and that, they, 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 it's lopsided, lopsided, lopsided appointment. Nigeria actually was the a major exporter of agricultural products. Then we had the records of the pyramids in the north. We had the uh, the west having a cuckoo in abundance. Then the south with a lot of palm oil. But I think uh, we, we we started missing it where we started having revenue from oil, from the discovery of oil in commercial quantity at Ulubri. Uh, immediately, there is export, export start uh, re generating a lot of revenue. The entitlement mentality, and especially revenue sharing become the in thing. So people start leaving agriculture. We did not see it as being fanciful again. People start going to offices to relax. Our graduates start, uh, instead of going into farm to produce, they start wearing ties, then waiting for oil sector and the service sector. So there was a total drift away from the agricultural sector to the service sector. This eventually led to the collapse of the agricultural sector, resulting to shortage in food supplies and the eventual security challenges that we're having today. As at now, we are in a very serious economic uh, problem. The only way we can do that is actually to go back to agriculture. And how do we do that? Recognizing the place of agriculture in national development. Any economy that is unable to feed itself cannot actually prosper in other sectors of the economy because it has fed them both physical, psychological, and social. So to return back to where we have been known with the glory of Nigeria, we should look at our large expanse of land we have, see how to employ the youth into it, and most especially, not just employing, but make sure that whatever output you get from them, they must be off-takers. You don't expect them to produce, and they'll be the one that will be working within the value chain, right from the farm to, the, to where they're going to distribute it. People should be ready, government should be able to see policies that are going to put in place to take off all agricultural produce in the economy. I will suggest and emphatically state that it would be better if we can revamp our commodity exchange that we have in Abuja. We have a commodity exchange. Then we should let farmers understand and know what futures market is. Futures market is, you, you talk of commodity futures, Products are not ready yet. People that want to go to farm, assure them that immediately they produce, you are going to pick it. Then in that case, you make funds available, just like the capital market that people make funds available for others to produce so that they wait, wait for dividend. Farmers can also get funds even before they go to farm. The funds that is made available for exchange in the futures market will be used for purchase of agricultural inputs this agricultural input will eventually yield the expected result and it will boost the entire system. Another sector in Nigeria that has seen several setbacks is the education and health care sector. Despite Nigeria's strategic location in Africa, the country's education and health care needs are severely underserved. Healthcare facilities, centers, personnel, and equipment are insufficient.
particularly in rural areas. And while the Nigerian government has proposed various reforms to address the wide-ranging issues in the healthcare system, they have yet to be implemented at the states and local government levels. And despite the country's sexagenarian age, while most of the policies introduced by the federal government has failed to take the country out of the wood. It's a well-known fact that uh, the education system has changed a lot. It used to be better than what we have now. At least immediately after independence, the education then was free, especially at the lower level. And even at the tertiary level, the, price and the fees wasn't that much. It was still affordable for parents. But these days, reverse is the case. And the uh, state government is not taking education seriously as in the past. And that is why we have so many private institutions, which is indirectly killing our public uh, schools. The public schools are no longer well attended to as in the past. The educators are not well taken care of. As a result, the job, excuse me, the job is no longer uh, attractive to people. So the dedication of past teachers is no longer there. And the, even the concentration and interest of students because of the new developments, the social uh, life that our youths are facing now, they pay less attention to education. So we can say categorically that education in the past is far better than what we have now. As Nigeria continues in her quest for development, the citizens remain on the lookout for signs of a true independent nation as an anniversary gift, and this year is no exception. Thank <laughs> you.